All right, the Community College Consortium for OER founded about seven years ago. Uh, the, our mission is promoting the adoption of OER to enhance teaching and learning. Um, expanding access to education, supporting professional development, and advancing the community uh -huh. college are all part of our strategies. And these webinars are part of our professional development um, to faculty and staff. And of course, students are also always welcome to these webinars as well. Our, uh, our consortium of community colleges here is still uh, North America has been our focus for the community colleges, although we're looking to expand. Um, we have been growing um, this summer, and I'm very happy to say that um, Michigan, uh, we've had um, the Michigan Virtual Campus join us this summer. We've had the Kentucky Library System, and we've had Cuyahoga Community College in Ohio join us. So those are just a couple of our brand new members, and we're very excited to have them. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to uh, start uh, the main part of our uh, webinar here. Um, we are going to hear about open courses that, uh, that librarians have developed in the Florida State College system, which will be available for um, instructors at other colleges to reuse uh, with their students. We are also going to hear about open science resources and open access research, um, particularly in the science area. And finally, we're going we're to hear about how librarians can work with the SPARC organization uh, to, find about, to find open educational resources, to support open policies and open licensing at their campuses. So at this time, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Patricia Profeta, who uh, is the Dean of Learning Resources at, Indi at Indian River State College in Fort Pierce, Florida. She's responsible for leading the college's multi-campus library system. Uh, it covers five campuses in four counties on Florida's research coast. And maybe she'll tell us a little bit more about what coast that is. Um, really 40,000 um, enrollments. Uh, occur at Indian River State College each year. And uh, Dr. Profeta oversees the library services for the college's e-learning program as well and the college's foundation, foundation Pioneer River Press. So uh, Dr. Profeta is a very busy, busy lady and we're very pleased to have her with us this morning. Uh, Pat? Thank you very much. Welcome, everyone. Is everyone hearing audio uh -huh. now? Awesome. Um, comments in the chat. Just wanted to make sure you were all there. I'm going to talk today about how open courses help libraries to lead the way. And to give you a sense of where Florida is in the scheme of things, I just wanted to, to point to where our group falls in the hierarchy. And you can tell from the slide that, uh, that it, it looks like a governmental organization, doesn't it? Florida has 28 two- and four-year public colleges, and the Learning Resources Standing Committee is part of the larger Council of Instructional Affairs. And you know, for purposes of ease, I'm just going to call this group the Standing Committee today. And this committee has one representative per institution, although any of the, the librarians and staff from the institutions can attend our meetings. There is one vote for institution. Uh, the Council of Instructional Affairs is comprised mainly of chief academic officers. And then these academic officers report to the 28 presidents who serve on the Council of Presidents, and they report to the chancellor, and the chancellor reports to the Office of the Commissioner of Education. So you can see it's, it's, it's quite a big hierarchy, and that's why we want it to be noticed in the scheme of things. Okay, why did we decide to openly license these courses? Well, there are a number of reasons, and I'm going to go through each of them in a little more detail. Uh, the first one is the Florida College System Presidents. Uh, they have an approach that we like to call speaking with one voice. In essence, when statewide initiatives require involvement from all of the 28 institutions, we find that the group is more successful when there's agreement in advance of any kind of public hearing or public discussion. So with the presidents, a lot of their collaborative work is done prior to any kind of public discussion. And two examples of this are the Florida College System 
funding formula and their budget. Um, also, the Standing Committee has had a history of cooperative action. Uh, examples from the library group include determining a common core of legislatively funded databases. We've been very fortunate that that has occurred in Florida. Uh, we support one another, too, with uh, accreditation, professional development. Uh, 2004, we had two back-to-back -back hurricanes in the state, so even in terms of natural disasters. So the Standing Committee does cooperate together. We collaborate. We find that there's, there's greater strength in numbers, and we do speak in one voice as well. Uh, we also wanted to promote the Orange Grove, which is Florida's digital repository for instructional resources. Uh, the Orange Grove was being used by people, but we felt that it could bring, we could bring more attention to the Orange Grove through our own joint efforts, and that has stayed off through the years. Uh, you should take a look through at the Orange Grove. It has a collection of open textbooks, uh, including Orange Grove Textbook Plus, print-on-demand options. They have STEM textbooks and more. We also found, too, that librarians are information literacy experts, curriculum designers, and instructors at their local institutions. And we found that our open source courses, we, can, we could bring the expertise of these librarians recognition at a statewide level. And what we've done with these courses is we've also provided librarians with leadership opportunities. They chair the committees, they develop the courses, they design the assessments, they revise the content annually. A library administrator acts as the liaison between the library um, the, the working group, so to speak, and the larger standing committee. So the administrator is a conduit for discussion and questions and, and so on. Since the Council of Instructional Affairs also includes continuing and adult education as well as occupational education, the librarian is recognized as an expert in many circles, and that was also our intent was to spread the word. We would like everyone to use our open license and adapt the content. The course number that, you, that you'll see for these two courses reflects the Florida statewide course numbering system, but you can change it any way you want. Florida has the Library and Information Studies programs at two of our major universities, so that's why it's part of the course numbering system for this state. So that's why we've decided to openly license our courses and lots of reasons, and we've been very fortunate with our approach and very successful locally as well. So we have two courses. The first one I'm going to speak about is LIS 2004, which is Introduction to Internet Research. And this first course was at, uh, the Standing Committee opted to develop this course in 1996. And we first published it in 1997. This course is also revised annually. I'm just going to piggyback that a little and say in 1990, Indian River State College, where I work, we began offering a nationally recognized electronic access to information series which became a model for many local colleges offering similar courses in, in Florida. So that framework was, for that series was part of the original review for LIS 2004. So the Standing Committee developed a statewide one-credit web-based course, which we hoped would help students to learn basic internet research skills. So the original charge to the Course Development Committee was to develop this one-credit course to provide students with those skills we believe were necessary to use the internet as a supplemental resource in our community college libraries. The course would also enforce, you know, reinforce instructional efforts by our librarians so that they could teach basic research strategies and introduce our students to the internet, online library catalogs and online databases. So that's, you know, you're looking at 15 years ago that we started this one. Um, I think I've included in this slide a, a link to our LibGuide, the Indian River State College version. We use this course for credit, for non-credit, for directed independent study, for learning objects, which can be embedded into other courses, and for other uses as well. And what our librarians do locally is we adapt this content as an entire team. I have six librarians, and they work together to create the content that our students will see locally. But we are using the model from the state. What I've done is, I, in order to demonstrate how the course took shape, I included the, course, the current course outline. Each lesson will offer a brief description of the content that we cover. Uh, the Standing Committee website includes the link to the Orange Group, which shows the, also shows the current course content, so you'll have direct access to the content. 
The course revision committee most often uses Google Docs to host its work. And the website does include a link to Google Docs so you can show the committee, so you can see the committee's work, it's the content, the documents, the goals, the membership, and so on. This course is revised annually for statewide usage. The statewide committee, however, does not monitor local usage because of the license. We let everyone do their own thing. Okay. I've also included for today's talk a sample lesson so that you can see that uh, we do have course objectives for every lesson to give you a sense of the content covered. So lesson six is evaluating internet resources. So this lesson addresses when you should use the internet, the types of sites available, such as government, education, nonprofit and advocacy, news sites, business and marketing sites, personal web pages and blogs, wikis, discussion groups, and search engines. Excuse me. And of course, evaluation is part of this lesson, as is objectivity and bias. For the final course project in this particular class, students create an annotated bibliography that cites and describes five of the best resources that they've found on a related or alternative career path from the one that they've originally chosen for themselves. So there's also a course project evaluation checklist so that students can be guided with the process. So it's, it's a credit class, it's a college class, and it is full of, of all, all of the content and the assessment pieces and the rubrics that we need to utilize in, in other college courses. The second one that we talk about is LIS 1000. This is a relatively new class. This, uh, this came about probably around the year 2006. This is internet, uh, Introduction to Information Literacy. And this came about when the Florida College System began dis discussing learning outcomes around 2005. And what I've done on the slide is I've included the statewide learning outcomes that resulted from those meetings in 2005-2006. As you can see, information literacy was one of the outcomes highlighted in red, as was critical thinking. This course took a little bit longer to bring to publication than the original one. As you remember, the Internet Research course had local content back in the early 90s from which it could draw. The standing committee determined that its members could contribute to statewide instructional issues through the creation of this joint information literacy initiative. So the standing committee, saw, they charged the statewide committee on information literacy, a group that we put together with librarians, to review current information literacy classes offered locally by our colleges and to create course materials for a statewide course on information literacy. The content had to support national standards for information literacy and the assessment of the skills. So the result was LIS 1000, Introduction to Information Literacy, which contains learning objectives, rubrics, lesson plans, assessments, everything that we hope a two-year Florida college student would learn for information literacy. And the learning objectives were adapted from the ACRL standards. And of course, we all know where they are. I'm not going to go on and on about them. Um, but this class was uploaded in 2012. And again, I've included uh, the Indian River Lib Guide so that you can see what we've done locally with the course. This will be of interest to all of you. This slide shows an example of the template that the committee used to map both national standards and the state standards to the course content. The full template is available on the uh, Council of Instructional Affairs, the Learning Resources Standing Committee web webpage, which you have a link to right up there in the top. Uh, one of my librarians, Alexis Carlson, will be chairing this committee uh, in the year 2013-2014. So we'll have a lot of local input as well. Uh, but you can see the mapping is quite nice, and we wanted to do both national and state. So if a college was not interested in mapping nationally, they did not have to. In our case, Indian River likes to map to both national and state standards because it just shows that there's more of a connectivity between what we're doing locally and how we see ourselves uh, addressing national needs. And I've given you another sample lesson showing the national and the state standards mapped to a particular lesson. Um, the activity and the external, external resources can be changed according to local needs. If your institution wants to design its own activities or resources, they can be included. And the activities and resources, both of those are, are other areas where OERs might be utilized. So just think of 
think of OERs when you're creating your own courses or if you're enhancing this particular course structure for your, for your local needs. What's happening to us in the future? Well, I will say that we're looking at MOOCs. The Standing Committee meets at the end of this month and we're going to explore the feasibility of a MOOC using both of these courses. We also want to integrate more social media into both courses. We want to include more OERs into both courses. So you can see there's a lot of work ahead. It's, it's never a process that ends. These courses follow a, re a revision process that facilitates periodic updating and refreshing. So the courses are interesting and current for both the students and the instructors. And again, I want to ask you to use the open license and adapt the content. And just a reminder again that the course numbers reflect Florida system, but you can use them any way you need. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pat. Um, and you know, once again, a big kudos to uh, Dr. Profeta and her team of librarians there in Florida who have stepped up and um, created open courses. As I do workshops throughout the country, I'm often asked, where are the information literacy and the internet, internet browsing um, open courses? And um, here is a wonderful example of those courses. Um, and in the past, I haven't really had a good answer. So I want to thank Pat for that. And as she mentions, there's a lot of work ahead. And, and the promise of open education is that um, you too out there, if you're a librarian or you work on the development of curriculum for this, uh, can participate in this process and adapt uh, these courses and share back with the open license um, process. So thanks again, Pat. And we are going to hold questions till the end, but um, do feel free to uh, start putting your questions in the uh, chat window um, at this time, and we'll try and get back to those at the end. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Donna Okubo who is the Senior Manager for Community Outreach and Advocacy at the Public Library of Science. Uh, Donna has over 15 years in nonprofit um, experience with membership and fundraising, and she, uh, the last nine of which have been at the Public Library of Science. Um, she's also very active in the Asian American community and serves as a program advisor for the San Mateo Library Cultural Diversity Project, the California State University Monterey Bay Obata Mural Campaign, and the Monterey JACL Historic Preservation Program. And Donna is going to tell us uh, more about what pu the Public Library of Science does and how um, you as faculty um, and perhaps deans and directors at community colleges can uh, find these resources, uh, bring them into your classroom, or bring them to the attention of faculty if you work directly with faculty. Um, and these are science resources and open access science journals of a very high quality. So Donna, um, I'd like to turn it over to you now. Thank you very much, Una. So, um, let's see. Oh. so is this you? And uh, are you looking for content? Um, do you need images, videos, just OA content that you can use with your, you know, the textbooks, curriculum, and lesson planning? Or this could be you. So I know that there's this uh, interactive button here, and I was just curious if there's a little hand in the toolbox, and if people can raise their hand. And um, I'm just curious to know how many people know about open access journals. Uh, great. Ooh, okay. Some of you guys do? Good, good. Um, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about PLOS. And so PLOS is an open access journal and we publish science and medical research. Um, we're a nonprofit um, publisher and advocacy organization. And we're we're founded we're founded to um, you know, accelerate progress in science and medicine by leading a transformation in research publication uh, communication. Um, POS became a publisher in 2003, and we were founded by Harold Barmus, who is a Nobel laureate and who was the past director of the NIH, and also now is the current director of the National Cancer Institute. Um, the other founder was Pat Brown, who's with Stanford University, and um, Mike Eisen, who is with uh, UC Berkeley. 
So, um, you know, as you know, with with PLOS, we're an open access journal, and basically our idea was really to make sure that uh, the results of science research was freely available to everybody because we felt that it was important that um, people could share and reuse the information. And with technology, it allows us to do things like this. Traditional publishers, however, um, when you must have a paid prescription, a subscription, or you have to maybe pay thirty dollars per article, and so um, it gets to be quite expensive. Um, also, the publishers, for traditional publishers, retain the rights, and it's very restrictive of the the research, and there is also no reuse. And one other thing too is that. You know, research is generally funded by the government, mainly like the NIH and other uh, government agencies. And so, in essence, by paying for that sub subscription, you're actually paying twice for the research. One through your taxpayer dollars, and the other part is through the, the subscription model. So PLOS has over seven journals, we have PLOS One, PLOS Biology, PLOS Medicine, PLOS Genetics, uh, PLOS Computational Biology, PLOS Pathogens, and PLOS Neglected Tropical Diseases. Um, so they're all open access and again freely available. And you know, as you can tell by some of these numbers, you know, we publish. So far, we've published probably about 85,000. Articles since or through June 2013. Um, you know, we have about over 170,000 authors, um, and we also, you know, there's about 5.3 page views per month, which is which is actually really good. So the open access publishing industry is actually really a growing business. Um, and so the one thing to know is there's a lot of content for you to be able to use and mine um, and, and use. So one thing is we, we you know all these open access journals you know got started so people can read the content and we're hoping you know groups like yourself will start to do that. So how many of you know what open access is? I don't know if you could still use the little hand things. Okay. Looks like over half. <laughs> good. It's growing. Yeah. Good. Good. Okay. So one quick thing is, um, you know, open access. Again, it's freely available and unrestricted reuse. Um, you know, it's it's immediate. Um, there's no charge. There's no embargo period where you have to wait. And reuse is really supported by a Creative Commons attribution license. And so all the materials in the PLOS journals all have a CC BY licensing. And so now you're thinking, well, geez, I can I can reuse the OA content and for free. And uh, Yes, you can. And so, again, this is one image that was published in a in a PLOS article. And um, you know, as long as you uh, you attribute to it and you cite it, um, you you could freely use it. You could um, repurpose it. And so, it's kind of really exciting. Um, but here's some other ways that people are using OA content. And this is with Arizona State University. And they're using it on their website as part of their their content for their um, Ask a Biologist. And they're partnering with PLOS, and they they use you know all of our PLOS biology articles. And as you can tell, there's images, there's links, um, and then it's kind of really again kind of an add-on to what they have for just their general content for like uh, you know a toolbox and things like that. But they've really integrated. Um, our content, and we hope that they would do this with other publishers as well. Another thing is um, lesson plans. So, um, 
you know, you can create lessons plans. This is kind of a really old article that was monkey see, monkey do. And um, it was showcased in the Learning Network um, for the New York Times. But keep in mind too, there's opportunities like if you see a series of articles, and, and this isn't really as science uh, content as much, but um, one of the uh, editorial board members put together 10 simple rules for researchers. And then the papers ended up being kind of a number of papers, and it ended up being a collection. But what they ended up doing was they published a collection, but they started to make course packs out of it. They started to teach classes around it. So you know, again, there's a lot of different ways and uses of what you can do with, um, you know, with our content as well. Let's see. And then. This is something that we just recently did at PLOS, and it's it's kind of a what we're calling it just sort of our image collection, and you know it is open to the public. But it's something I wanted you to keep in mind is that you can do this on your own, and you can create these things, or you can create these tools, so you can aggregate these images or anything else that you want. It could be publications, it could be articles, it could be anything. And it might be aggregated so it's for your institution, or it might be based on a discipline, um, and it might be even just for this community who's together now, or the OER, you know, for the OER space or something. And say, here's some content that's easily, uh, you know, freely available to you. So again, just making it easier to find and to do things. But again. The whole purpose of this is is being able to kind of reuse and um, and reaggregate and having it freely available. So Una, I don't know. Do you want to try to put together the the video? Um, sure. We have a few extra minutes. So um, um, Donna has a video of a, a teacher in middle school who is talking about the importance of. Um, of bringing um, primary resources in science classroom. And I'm going to uh, take you there to watch this one minute video. If um, you don't get a chance to watch it today because of technical issues, I'll put the, the, it also in our um, window, uh, in our chat window so that you can see it later. What should be appearing on your screen is a, is a picture of this teacher, uh, Barbara Stebbins, who's going to share with us. And you need to click on the um, on the triangle at the bottom to make that play on your um, computer. And I think she has some really interesting things to say uh, to educators. Amazing. I mean, I got an article about male mice singing, which was a news article summarizing a plus original research paper. I can actually go access that article. I can hear the mouse song. I can have my students hear the mouse song. You get details of how people carried out their experiments. And when people start asking the question, that's where they go. They go, how do they do that? The more people you have participating in the process, having access to others who do science, stimulating young people who are thinking about what to do with their future, to me it's just obvious. It makes the best science. Okay, I hope I hope everyone was able to view that. If not, I have popped it into the chat window so you can check that out later. Uh, back to you, Donna. And and so as you can tell, it's high level research, but it's you know we had this middle school teacher take this to her you know her middle school classroom, and she's able to take that at a different level. But you can also again take it to high school. You can take it to you know college level. Um, and so again. It's it's really up to you on what you want to do with it, um, but I think it's um, it was exciting to see her her use the content and and show her students. And if you if you listen to the to the video, you could hear the singing mice in the background. Um, so what I've also done is provided on this uh, slide is some additional open access journal resources. So there's the directory of open access journals. Um, there is the Open Access Scholarly Publishers Association, and then also to get more information and clarity on open access, some of the policies that are going on, you know how it might affect your institution. 
um, a really good resource is Open Access Directory. And I think they are really great spots um, to really look at. And then there is Spark, but Nicole will talk about that. So one thing is my final takeaway is one, you know, again, we, we made this content so people would use it. And so we really hope that you, you do integrate this in your coursework, in your textbooks, um, you know, in your MOOCs and things like that. Also, let us know when you've done that because we can also help showcase some of this too. And the, the most, uh, what's really helpful to us to keep this movement of open access content freely available is by showing you know, government or policy makers that um, people are actually using it. So um, if you do happen to make something from our, our journals or anything, you know, send me an email. Send, uh, or give me a call or let me know that you, you've done this. And so again, um, that, that's about it. But um, thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Donna. And uh, we will um, have questions for Donna at the end. I just wanted to mention that, uh, or Donna, I just, there was a few things that came up in the chat window about um, the materials. And I, I believe you stated that they were Creative Commons licensed. But um, I just want you to um, <laughs> Just confirm that because there was some question about the copyright um, versus Creative Commons, but these are free to reuse under yeah. the Creative Commons license. Yeah, I did. I did. I did double check that, and I'll send you the links. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. Um, all right. Um, Now it's my pleasure to introduce Nicole Allen, who is the new OER Program Director at uh, SPARC, the Scholarly Publishing and Academic Resources um, Coalition. Um, Nicole um, joined, just recently joined SPARC, I think just this summer, uh, to lead their OER program and expand uh, that. Uh, as you know, SPARC has been very um, involved in open access research and journals um, to date. Uh, Nicole has been a leading figure in the OER movement for the last seven years where she's directed a national campaign uh, through student purge to combat the rising cost of college textbooks. And Nicole is going to talk to us today about um, Spark's outreach to librarians and um, how they would like to support librarians in um, their open education work. And I'll turn this over to you, Nicole. Well, thanks so much, Una. It's it's truly a pleasure to be here. Um, so, uh, as Una said, um, Spark it stands for the Scholarly Publishing and Academic Resources Coalition, and we're a membership organization of academic and research libraries that work to promote a more open system for scholarly communication and sharing knowledge. And we have about 200 member institutions in the U.S. and Canada, as well as a worldwide network. And I'm excited to talk to you today about how libraries can fit into the OER movement and how some libraries are already leading the way and what we're planning to do to support and expand that through our members. So Spark is, is best known for our work on open access, which we just heard about from, from Donna. Spark has become one of the leading advocacy groups on this issue. We've worked to pass policies that make publicly funded research available free to the public, and have also worked at the campus level to enable more research authors to publish open access. And OER fits into Spark's larger mission to promote a more open system for sharing all of the outputs of the research process. And over the last year, our member libraries have become increasingly interested in, in, in expanding into educational resources. And you know, it's really easy to see how there's a, a big dichotomy between the huge potential that the Internet offers to transform teaching and learning and, and how we share knowledge, um, and how the existing systems for, for publishing educational resources just aren't taking advantage of that. And we really believe that OER provides the ideal framework to fully harness the digital environment to expand access and reduce costs and also improve learning. Um, so our OER program is seeking to kind of tackle this from both the supply and demand sides of the equation, so seeking to expand the adoption of OER and also instigate the development of more high quality OER. And 
the role librarians can play in OER could not have come at, at a more critical time. So obviously there's a lot of OER content out there and it's being used in informal settings, but in terms of, of informal higher education and formal adoptions, we're still in the phase of early adopters and innovators and are now facing the famous chasm before entering the mainstream. Um, this is Jeffrey Moore's famous theory that new technologies like OER always need extra help to fulfill the conditions necessary for adoption in broader markets. And libraries are in a prime position to help expand OER use and really get across that chasm. So first of all, I think just libraries play a natural role because it's the place on campus where people go to seek out high quality educational resources. I mean, faculty already work with librarians to curate resources for their research and, and course development, so OER can be a logical extension of that. Um, and obviously the specifics differ from campus to campus, but that relationship exists everywhere. And one of the biggest challenges we hear from faculty in adopting OER is just figuring out where to search for resources. We've heard that echoed um, with, with Donna and Pat and um, figuring out logistical questions also like license compatibility and, and how to get print copies. And there's, that is something that libraries are in a position to help faculty with. And then I think there's also that libraries are already well connected to other constituencies on campus who would be interested in promoting OER. Uh, for those of you who know my background, I've had extensive experience mobilizing students to promote OER and having that second layer of support for faculty to answer questions um, about you know, the specifics and help identify resources really has been missing from student advocacy and could make it a lot more effective in, in partnership with libraries. Um, and I also want to just point out that a lot of libraries already recognize that there's a need for OER and they're taking action on OER. Uh, libraries offer textbook reserve programs where students can, can check out textbooks that are really expensive for a few hours and you know, see the impact that the costs are having on students. And a number of libraries have already started programs to promote the development and use of OER. And I want to highlight uh, four examples that I think are particularly compelling. There, there are a number of them out there. Um, but just starting with one of Spark's members, the UMass Amherst Libraries, um, their Open Education Initiative offered small grants to faculty who agreed to replace their expensive textbooks with OER and other free resources from the library. And librarians assisted faculty with identifying those resources. And since 2001, it has generated, they estimate, uh, $750,000 in student savings, which is truly remarkable. The next example is at Tacoma Community College. Some of you may have heard about this already. And uh, their program is, is called Liberate 250K. And the goal was to save students $250,000 on textbook costs over two years through the use of OER. And the main kind of core of the program was to hire a librarian who would work with faculty to build out their courses with OER. And they were actually able to hit their $250,000 savings goal within their first year and now are hoping to double it by the end of the two-year term. So already we're up to over a million dollars in student savings just with those two programs. Um, an another great program, and again, many of you may have heard of this, is the University of Minnesota's Open Textbook Library, often called the Open Textbook Catalog. And uh, it was started by the University of Minnesota's College of Education, but quickly partnered with the library to help with developing the catalog and curating the list of high quality open textbooks that are available in this library. And so far they've run a workshop at the University of Minnesota that ended in a number of adoptions and are currently to set up a series of workshops at other colleges to support OER adoption. 
And the final example I, I want to share is uh, actually concerns OER creation. So some libraries at research institutions are starting to take on the responsibilities of publishing academic contents. And in the case of Oregon State University, um, they are, are working very closely with their university, university press. And over the summer, OSU put together an RFP for open textbook authors. And they'll provide a flat fee to the author and editorial support for publishing an open textbook through the Oregon State University Press. So this is a hugely exciting program. And um, they should be announcing what book they're, they're going to pick for, for it um, in November. So there, there are many examples of um, this kind of program, but this provides a good taste of what libraries can do and are doing. And Spark is working to develop a program that can help get more libraries involved and work to promote the adoption and creation of OER. And as Una said, we're relatively, um, I'm just starting out with Spark, and we have a lot of work to do, but I want to share with you our plans and hopefully get any librarians in the crowd or others who want to work with librarians excited so we can get in touch and start working together. So the main thing that we're going to do is set up what we're calling the Librarian Liaison Network to help bring together librarians who are already working on OER and help build a community of practice and share resources and just you know, elevate the visibility of what's already going on on campuses. We're also going to put together educational resources and programming for librarians who are interested in learning more about OER and figuring out what they can do on their own campuses to support it. And that will, of course, you know, include librarians in the Spark network, but be open to librarians everywhere. And we also want to work to connect librarians with efforts that are already underway to promote OER. As I was saying before, librarians at a really critical level of support that could help many faculty or student-led efforts. And um, finally, we are going to be working, continuing to work on policy at the local, state, and federal level to support the adoption and creation of OER. Uh, we're already actively working in Congress to advocate for a grant program that would provide grants to develop open textbook pilot programs, and also looking into opportunities to pass legislation to fund open textbooks like the California program that was recently passed. And then we'll always, of course, be looking for ways to connect members of the campus community, librarians, and others into these efforts at the grassroots level, because that's just really important for, for passing policies. So for those of you who are interested in learning more about Spark and, and what we're doing on OER, I encourage you to uh, check out our website and um, add your name. Uh, there's a form there if you want to stay in the loop or, or find out more specifically about OER. And um, just to close on a personal note, um, Una mentioned I've been an OER advocate for a long time um, and I've done a lot of work with students and faculty. And um, I am so excited to be working with librarians. You know, all of the programs and conversations that, that I've heard about and had conversations with people, um, I think librarians have so much to bring to the OER movement and already have brought so much that I think there's a lot that we can do in partnership with them. So uh, with that, I will turn it back to you, Una, and hopefully we have time for questions. Great. Thanks very much, um, Nicole. And, oh. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was putting something in the chat window there and got a little confused. Uh, yes, librarians rock. I was uh, I tried to reiterate what Curtis had said there. And um, uh, thank you, Nicole, for sharing those um, new um, collaborations that will be possible um, for librarians through Spark. Um, and we have, in the Community College Consortium, have always had an active cadre of librarians who have um, supported us and supported their campuses. So. Um, it's wonderful to just uh, reach out even further and, um, and um, continue that. So uh, we are going to move now to questions. But before we do that, I want to mention um, our next webinar, which is coming up um, October 30th. So that's, I think, in about three weeks. Uh, it will be once again at noon Pacific time, 3 p.m. Eastern. This one will be on open textbooks adoption and sustainability. 
And we will be looking at a couple of big statewide programs. Um, uh, once again, we will have Florida. Uh, Dr. Robin Donaldson will join us to talk about the Florida Orange Grove uh, project a repository and tell us more about how that is going. We will also hear from British Columbia on, on their open textbook effort. Uh, which is about a year old. And finally, we will hear from California, the California State University who will be leading uh, the Open Textbook Project here in California. So stay tuned for that one. And on to questions. So as I mentioned, um, I'm going to go ahead and turn on the mics now so that if you do have a microphone uh, with uh, echo canceling and all that, you can click on the talk button. Um, to speak live, or we can take questions from uh, the chat window. There was a question a little bit earlier um, referring to uh, what Nicole uh, was mentioning about um, OER and open textbooks. And um, I believe it was Alan who asked, um, do, has um, the use of OER contributed to additional printing occurring on campus? And um, I, I, Quill uh, West did, did actually address that in the chat window. Um, uh, Pat, I don't know if you wanted to did talk about uh, has using open courses contributed to print issues on campus where, where students are, are now printing out the open resources uh, since they're not purchasing a textbook. Um, I can say that we charge for printing here. <laughs> so okay. I haven't seen that, but, but really in general, we find that a lot of students get their open access resources and they can utilize them on their personal devices. We're not finding that they're printing out scads of paper. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, and of course, students can print them at home as well. <laughs> Correct. Correct. <laughs> um, all right. Let's see. We've got a question here. Um, let's see. I'm trying to do this in order here. Um, let's see. For Pat. Uh, do you have a time frame for working on the analytics that show the con contribution to student success? And that was a question from David. David, that would be yesterday. <laughs> because we're always trying to show how librarians contribute to student success, but it's hard to connect what we do with them and what the end result is when they finish a course. So that's always on our minds. But, but I can't say that, that there is one locally. Uh, that is a goal of ours, and we're I'm fortunate to have some fellow deans who also find the need to, to see that uh, that connection. So I'm hoping this year we'll be able to do it locally, statewide. It's a little harder, a little harder to uh, give a timeline there. I, I hope that kind of answers your question. All right, thank you, Pat. Um, Amy, um, I, I noticed Amy was having audio problems with this, um, and I'm sorry to hear that, Amy. Um, we do have our teleconference bridge on during the recording, and um, so um, I certainly hope that uh, this archive will have an audio track. Um, it, it always has in the past, so I, I once again apologize for those technical issues. Um, let's see, James uh, Glapic Roseclag had a question for, for Nicole here. Nicole, did you read that one? Or I can read it out and then you can answer it. What's the best way for community college librarians to learn about SPARC's OER initiatives? Are you disseminating information via um, ALA, for example? Um, so uh, thanks, James. We are, as I said, we're just getting started um, and getting the program up and running. So at this time, the best thing um, is connect them with me. And I will um, keep everybody in the loop, and then and you know keep an eye on our website about um, opportunities to get involved. I put up a link before um, uh, where people can sign up for more information about OER our OER stuff, and I'll put that in the chat window. Okay, thank you, Nicole. Um, Nancy had a comment about the Spark Library Network, and um, she's really pleased that. Um, uh, it, it'll help prevent reinventing the wheel at local levels, and so it would be nice to see a group effort to organize and inform. So thank you for that, Nancy, um, and I think Nicole will be working on that. Um, Paul at Mount, um, I'm not sure, Mount SAC um, asked about textbooks available for e-readers. And there are open textbooks available for e-readers or open educational resources. Um, Paul, uh, we're 
Connections, which is a large OER repository, um, has EPUB available for all of its learning modules, which are organized into textbook collections. Um, not all repositories have um, have formats for mobile devices, but it's definitely a direction that they're moving in. Um, um, all right. Okay, so um, our our gentleman from India, Naglaksan, um, would like um, to be notified of upcoming events, and um, we'll I'll I'd be happy to work with you on that and add you to our list. If anyone would like to be added to um, our um, community college um, advisory expanded list, uh, please email me. Um, my it, my email address is there on the page, and it's, I'll put it in the chat window as well. It's Unity Daily at OCW Consortium. Org, and I would uh, be very happy to notify you of upcoming events. I'm, I'm busy scanning here, but um, do any of my uh, presenters here see questions that were directed at them and that they would like to answer? David asks the National Council for Learning Resources and Affiliate Council of the American Association of Community Colleges had a position statement on OER passed by the board of AACC. Oh, well, thank you for sharing that, David. That's very exciting. Uh, and um, Curtis has asked us, what has been an effective way to incentivize faculty to convert courses? And how much do they have to be paid? <laughs> so that, that's an interesting question, and I, I'm not sure that um, a very good question. I'm not sure that it, um, any of our um, presenters today um, have worked on that issue. But um, um, Pat, um, do you have any experience in that area? I can I can speak to that. Um, okay, lovely. The courses that I spoke about today were actually designed statewide. So they don't belong to an institution. When you are at the local level, what happens is course content, in most cases, is the intellectual property of the institution. So uh, if you're looking to convert a course to open to an OER type environment, open access, that's a local decision. And how much are they paid? That's a local decision. So a lot of these things are tied up with local institutional policies. I, I think that would answer the question. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. And um, um, so just to, just to follow up on that, many of our members in the community college consortium have projects where stipends are available to faculty. And um, we'd love to share more of that with you. So please do uh, use my email, and I can share with you um, specific case studies about that. But it is, once again, it is a local decision. Um, at this point, um, I don't see any other questions. Oh, there, Elizabeth. Uh, she, okay. Well, thank you, Elizabeth, for sharing. She said at CF, um, which must be her institution, we offered $600 mini grants to faculty to experiment with developing e-text and open resources, and we got eight early adoptions in the process. Very thank nice. You. Yeah, that's wonderful. Elizabeth, could you tell us what institution you're with? Um, I, I'm just not familiar with the acronym ATCF. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, and I'd, I'd like to give my um, presenters now another uh, big round of thanks for joining us today. Um, if you have any final comments, um, I'd like to uh, go ahead and let you do that. Um, Donna, do you have any final comments before we close today? Um, no, but one is thank you everybody for all your the good work that you're doing and um, in these good spaces and making education you know affordable and accessible to everybody. Wonderful, and and thank you, Donna, for uh, sharing your uh, your information at at the Public Library of Science. Nicole, any any final comments? Um, thank you, everybody, for coming, and I'm excited to continue working with you. Thank you. All right, and uh, and Pat, any final comments? Just thank you, everyone, for your interest in what we're all doing, and we hope to continue our efforts. Thank you again. All right, wonderful. Um, so uh, 
big round of applause to my presenters and um, thank you all for coming and participating with us today. And I hope that you'll join us again at the end of the month for our, um, our second webinar in the fall series. And at this point I'm going to turn off the recording and uh, I will be here for a few more minutes if you have any additional questions or please feel free to use the email addresses at the bottom of the screen there to catch up with us later. Thanks again.